do the uh, this part, the recording thing. It's recording now. I press record so you can start. Right. Do you want to do the intro slides too, Paku? Yeah, yeah. If Sandra, do you want to? You want me to just go ahead and start the intro slide? Oh, no, uh, I'll introduce everybody. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the August Garbage uh, and Recycling Advisory Committee meeting. Um, I'm Sandra Smith, your vice chairman and host for the evening. Um, I'm filling in for Chairman Ashvid because he is not here today. Um, so uh, I guess the first thing on the agenda is roll call and introductions. Yeah, so, let's have Paku do the logistics real quick, Sandra, then we'll do the roll call. Okay. Just just for the, the I'll, audience members. I'll turn it over to uh, Paku. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to do just the basic logistics first, and then we can start. Let me know if you can see my screen. Can you see? Yes. Okay, perfect. Alrighty. So welcome to the September 8th, 2022 Garbage and Recycling Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, we sh all should be connected via audio broadcast, and this presentation is being recorded. It will be, be posted on to the Washington County Solid Waste and Recycling webpage one week from today. Um, we have times on the agenda for public comment, and if you experience any technical difficulty during this broadcast, you can use this link here to ask for help. This uh, meeting is being supported by Spanish translation services. All panelists and attendees should have the option at the bottom of your screen to go between the two rooms. And then lastly, uh, only the committee chair or vice chair may recognize a public attendee. Um, there is time on the agenda for public comment. And at that time, if you are a public member, you may use the raise your hand feature to participate. And I think that ends my part. I will pass it back to um, uh, Sandra. So let me stop sharing. Yeah, I, I was a month behind. I meant to say welcome to September's meeting. <laughs> Jeez. OK, um, I guess next is introductions of everyone and roll call. So, okay. Let me just call, or does Paku want to do it? I'm looking for the list of people. I have it. So if you want to, I can go ahead. Okay. So our chair, uh, Ashvan, is not here today. Uh, Sandra Smith? Here. <laughs> do you want, oh, okay. You I'll go. What yeah. do I do? <laughs> okay. Uh, Leslie Albert? Here. Hannah Carson? Okay, Hannah may be joined by phone, but I don't hear her, so. Uh, Thomas Egoston. Here, thank you. Myra Hernandez. Hey, okay. <laughs> Pete Pastert. Present. Sue Shade. Here. Vinod Singh. Here. And then we're gonna go off to staff. Ricardo Palazuelo. Presented. Sorry, Ricardo, if I butcher your name, or your last name. <laughs> Kathy Folsom. Here. And then we have some, some presenters, but I don't think they're here yet, so we can skip that. Our interpreters, Victor Shepard. Victor? His hands up. OK. And then Leticia Munis. And I think that concludes the roll call. Back to you, Sandra. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the GRAC Communications and Solid Waste Recycling Program updates. Uh, I think that's for Tom, so I'll turn it over to him. Sure. I will actually ask Kathy to do the GRAC updates real quick, and then I'll give some program updates. Okay. Sure, um, I'll uh, combine it with the, the third item on the agenda as well. Um, first item is we are actively recruiting for the vacant um, 
CRAC uh, member position. It's a public member. Um, the county's recruitment period ends toward the end of October. So there's plenty of time for folks to get their applications in. So if you know anyone or you have any idea of you know, an organization that you might belong to or know of, uh, I appreciate you passing on the message. Um, in my um, update email, I'll send the um, link again to where you apply to make it a little easier. Yes, Kat, and, and just in case some of you might not know this, Kathy Christie resigned after our last meeting in June. Um, she served many, many, many years on the committee and um, she decided that for personal reasons, now is the time to um, vacate her position. She would have turned out by March anyway, so it was just a few months early. So that, that's one um, committee news. Uh, also, I hope everyone got the info about the tours and are pretty excited about it. Um, reach out to Paku if you have any questions. Uh, you're gonna be able to see all three of the facilities and have lunch and Tom gets to drive the van. And, <laughs> and so I think it'll, it'll, be, it'll be really informative and it's a chance for um, the entire committee to um, join together and do something that's different than seeing each other in these little boxes. Uh, the upcoming um, calendar items, I'm, I'm continuing to attach a running calendar. Uh, oh yeah, one, one thing I forgot about the tour, we're also going to have Marnie Kyle, who is the director of HHS, and uh, Mira Simintel, who is the assistant county administrator, they're gonna join too. They've not been to see a landfill or any of the uh, sites that you guys are all gonna go to. So that should be um, really informative for them as well. Um, in the terms of the upcoming calendar items, like I said, I'm, I'm running about six months now. I tried to do a year, but there are too many things that change. Uh, the October meeting is pretty packed. There's gonna be a, probably at least a couple of action items. So hopefully we can get a quorum. Uh, I know that at least one of you already can't make October. So just keep that, if you'd keep that in mind, I'd really appreciate it. The Hillsborough Landfill Franchise Renewal is up. Um, it will be in front of the committee next month. Um, it currently expires at the end of November. So that should be very timely having just done a tour of the disposal site. Um, and then finally, there's just one item on the agenda that's changed. So number five was going to be the solid waste and recycling safety and disaster planning presentation from Erin, but she unexpectedly couldn't be here tonight. So instead, Tom is going to do um, a briefing on our draft solid waste and recycling strategic plan which, and then Erin will do her presentation in um, October. And I see that Leslie has her hand up. My hand up was long enough up <laughs> to where I think I answered my own question. Um, but I wanted to make sure that the list, do we have a list of upcoming meeting dates that's like up to date on the on our page? So we can, I can just make sure like with the holidays and stuff. It, it's up to date now through January. It's also attached as a second page to the agenda for every meeting as well. Okay, perfect. So it, it's out there on our website um, and then it gets attached so that the public can also see where, what's next. Great, so. I will scroll more next time. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you. So I, that, that's all I got for updates. I'm still looking for items of interest that you folks might want to have um, come, people come to the committee and talk about you know, different subjects. Uh, I know that Sandra was talking to me about maybe having the bottle uh, drop folks come and give us a, give a talk, the OBRC you know, presentation. Um, I've actually listened to one of their presentations before. It's rather, in, it's pretty interesting, things like that. So please shoot me an email. If, if something pops in your head or you can bring it up at the meeting um, and I'll see what I can do about uh, setting up something. And that's all I got. So I'll turn it back to Tom. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and I'm gonna try to moderate my 
pace for Victor and the translators uh, because I talk quickly. So I will try to do my best um, to, to be more intentional there. So a couple updates for the program. Um, first, since we haven't met since June, I just wanted to make sure you all knew that the Board of Commissioners adopted the rate package that your committee recommended in June. Um, if you recall, that included a general rate decrease for uh, commercial and Dropbox customers of about 4%, and then also a uh, reduced rate program for low-income residential customers in lieu of a rate decrease. Um, so the board adopted that recommendation as recommended by your committee. Uh, we're pretty excited about the reduced rate program. Uh, we are the first uh, municipality or the first jurisdiction in the state of Oregon that has a reduced rate program uh, for our garbage services now, and it's getting some attention. We have uh, city partners in Hillsboro and, and that are very interested in a similar program. City of Portland's working closely with Aaron on our rates uh, to try to think about how something might be similarly implemented in Portland. We were also invited to uh, present on the program at the Association of Oregon Recyclers Conference, which is happening in October this year. Um, so Aaron is going to have um, host a session with uh, Marina and Company, which are the consultants that helped develop it. Um, Carrie Wa uh, Walker McCallow from Walker Garbage Service, and Aaron will be working uh, the three of them together to kind of give a presentation overview about the reduced rate program. Um, we are also in conversations with Community Action Agency, which is a local agency here that does utility assistance programming and uh, rent assistance. And they are, uh, we're negotiating a, a scope of work for them to be our implementation partner for the eligibility screening process for the reduced rate program. It is uh, scheduled to become effective on January 1st of 2023. So we're pretty excited about the program and, and looking forward to a, a well oiled rollout of that program. Um, next update, um, the Recycle Plus program was also fully launched on July 1st of this year. Uh, we currently have approximately 300 households that are taking the service. Um, we're working through issues and growing pains with the haulers and some customers. Um, some of our challenges are related to uh, the, quant the quality and size of the bags being provided. There's a different variety of bags, but we have identified a good quality bag that Pride is using that, um, and we're sharing information with the other providers to make sure that we can get those, those bags out into circulation because they're holding up a lot better than some of the others. Um, also working on making sure that there's online options or web-based options to opt into a service pickup. Um, that was kind of a challenge early on for some of the providers too, in terms of having to do phone calls for the on-call service. Um, the Another update related to the Recycle Plus program, the City of Beaverton City Council uh, last month approved rates for Recycle Plus program effective November 1st. So that effectively implements the Recycle Plus program in the City of Beaverton. Um, staff are working on administrative rules to work through the details of the program and they are uh, planning to closely or identically align that with the county's Recycle Plus program because there's so much connection between Beaverton and the county in terms of the jurisdictional boundaries. Um, their administrative rule process is not a, a legislative process, it's adopted by their city manager. So their council has done its action by implementing the rates in terms of making that decision for the city of Beaverton. Uh, the city of King City also approved the Recycle Plus program, which went into effect on August 1st. Um, so city uh, King City is going, and then city of North Plains has uh, basically adopts similar rules, adopts, Im implements the rules adopted by the county. Uh, so the Recycle Plus program is also available in North Plains. Um, this, we also understand Clackamas County is working on a program uh, based on direction from their uh, county commission as well. So that's kind of an update on the Recycle Plus program. Uh, next topic, the DEQ, we're following closely as the Recycling Modernization Act continues to be implemented or planned for implementation. Um, the DEQ is working hard with several rulemaking advisory committees and technical work groups, talking about material lists, talking about producer responsibility fees and, and uh, producer responsibility organizational structure, uh, local government compensation, those types of things that are related to the bill. Um, so staff is 
participating in those conversations as attendees and following up in conversation with our local representatives. Um, City of Beaverton, Scott Keller is sitting on the recycling steering committee uh, for the state and uh, Pam Peck is also on that committee from Metro and I believe she is the, actually the chair of that committee. Uh, so that will be um, two local representatives that we're working closely with to kind of understand the issues and make sure that we can advocate for the interests of our community members in that space too. And then finally, um, we, the division, our division received a, a grant for $300,000 from Metro. Um, and that grant is for bulky waste collection services or removing bulky waste from our community. It's tied to some state funding that Metro received um, the last legislative session. Um, we're going to be funding, we proposed and uh, we're awarded funding for two, two discrete projects uh, in the county. Uh, the first one is a bulky waste voucher program, and we're trying to do a collection voucher, not just a disposal voucher. So historically, most dis voucher programs where you get a, a coupon and you go to the landfill and you give them the coupon, and you get to dump for free at the landfill for your, your truck or your load. But that includes barriers to access for folks that don't have vehicles or trucks that can haul uh, the bulky waste to the facility. So we're actually going to be trying to implement a bulky waste collection voucher through the franchise system through the haulers. So a customer or community member that needs to have bulky waste collected would just contact their garbage hauler. And then the voucher would be good for three bulky items to be picked up by their hauler. So say a refrigerator, a couch, and a mattress. Um, and that would be redeemed to the hauler and the hauler would then charge the county for that fee of that service uh, up to $150,000 worth of services. So staff are gonna be working closely with community members. Um, we're gonna be focusing on multifamily communities where the service issue and bulky waste is a big problem. And we're also gonna be focusing in equity focus areas um, that Metro defines in their um, equity focus area tool map. So we have some properties identified that we're gonna be working closely with and hopefully helping get folks, um, help, helping folks get those some of that bulky waste out of the the community. The second program is um, going to be a, an agreement or contract between the county and Open Door Housing Works. And Open Door Housing Works is a homeless services agency, and we're going to be funding for one year a workforce development type program. Um, and housing Open Door Housing Works is going to use the funding to hire a coordinator. And that will be working with folks experiencing or previously experienced houselessness, and they will be doing a workforce development cleanup crew. So the, the coordinator will be operating a pickup truck and a trailer, and the crew will be uh, community members that need work experience, and they'll be able to work and get um, have a job. And if they work enough, they will actually go on the payroll for Open Door, um, and they'll be out in the community helping pick up illegal dump materials, roadside litter, bulky waste, the free pile on the side of the road, um, and then also working in some of the homeless encampments, helping encourage folks to um, remove garbage from the camps and not just um, not let that waste accumulate as much as, as it can. They're not going to be doing any types of involuntary um, clearing or moving of camps. They're just going to be working in the camps, helping folks identify garbage and bag it and set it aside so it can be collected and picked up and taken for disposal. Those are my updates. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any, and if there aren't, I will pass it back to Sandra. That's fine. Anyone have any questions? So is, is the next item oral communication then? Since all that is, okay. Any oral communication? You're muted if you're talking Paku. It looks like we got a hand up. I'm so sorry. We do. We have an attendee with their hands up. Is that allowable at this time? Okay. I'm gonna so. okay. I'm gonna allow the person to speak. Okay. Hi, Brian. You should be able to speak. Hello, can you hear me okay? We can. Cool. Um, thanks. Um, I appreciate you guys having the hearing and giving me an opportunity to speak. Uh, big fan of the Recycle Plus, the potential. Clearly, I know you guys are working through challenges, which I appreciate. Uh, Thomas, I know we you gave me an email and I appreciated the feedback on that. 
A uh, couple of things I just wanted to bring to the committee just for consideration. Um, first, notification of the program does seem to still be lacking, and I was hoping to hear something about advertisement of it. I did a very informal survey on Nextdoor. 66% um, of the people had no idea about Recycle Plus, and that was with 53 people voting. Um, and then of the 34% that did vote, only 9% said they were going to use it. So. I uh, would really encourage this committee to try to find a way to drive adoption. Um, I want to give a shout out to Megan Schuler. I've been exchanging some emails with her on feedback on different things. Um, she's been really great to work with. Uh, one call out, um, I know you guys mentioned you guys are doing landfill assessments. I know a big worry with a lot of people I've talked to who were former Ridwell customers is, well, what's stopping them from just throwing the stuff away, right? I'm hoping that your assessment is going to somehow maybe incorporate, are they actively doing something with it? Because that is the fear, right? I mean, it's probably real cheap to say, well, you know what, let me just throw it in the dump and you know, I get all this extra money from Recycle Plus. Um, so we'd love to see some you know, way you could be transparent with the community on that. Um, clearly you don't want to violate any trusts or proprietary information or anything like that. Um, you know, I, I've had one pickup so far, uh, I'm not going to get into the details, but, you know, because I'm going to continue to work with Megan. Um, but, um, you know, I'm excited about the program. I love that it's coming out there. I love that you guys redesigned the website. I noticed that. And uh, WM is now providing the online request option. So really appreciate that as well. So love that you guys are putting the work in. Um, but, yeah, my main call out was just that adoption. Would love to see somehow you could drive that. So uh, thank you for letting me uh, be here today. Thank you, Brian. I will... Um share that um, Megan's team, so you mentioned Megan, so I can mention her team. They uh, actually have been working with a printing services company and tomorrow there should be a postcard mailer that drops at 70,000 households um, on, a, on specific addresses. So 70,000 households that are eligible for the service should be getting a postcard in the mail tomorrow. They also printed an additional 70,000 of those postcards without the mailing panels and that franchisees are gonna be asked to uh, leave those postcards behind in the glass bins after they're collected throughout the month of September. So before the rains start, hopefully we can leave those, um, leave behinds in the glass bins to also notify those uh, eligible customers of the new service that's available. Um, so I appreciate that feedback and I hope that helps um, some of that because that's our goal to get more people aware of the program. We've heard that is something that um, folks didn't really understand was available yet either. Uh, Bernard has a question. It's more of a, a statement for for Brian. We're um, we're receiving some of the materials from the the Recycle Plus program currently, and we're trying to figure out the best way to quantify. The materials because things like clamshells don't weigh very much so we're trying to figure out maybe uh, you know how we can best report that out things like like batteries which aren't recycled plus but kind of started that way we have we, we have good weights on those and the bulbs we're weighing and they're they are weighing the other materials but they just don't add up to very much so once we we figure the best way out to do that we'll start reporting more out to in a in a, in a format that that works for everybody so th there is being some tracking on it no, thank you. And it just real quick side comment on the batteries. Um, I saw waste management actually has collection, but it's through the glass, the red bin, not on Recycle Plus. I, I just learned that today. I think there's a lot of confusion. People I talk to on next door are not sure when the batteries are coming or if all haulers are equal. So, but thank you for the update. I appreciate it. Yeah, the batteries aren't part of, they're actually part of the regular program now in an incorporated Washington County. Is that right, Tom? Yeah, now it's tigered. Sherwood, Durham, King City, unincorporated Washington County, and Beaverton is going to join, I think, in November. So most of the county is going to start moving into the glass bin, batteries going into the glass bin. And, and I appreciate the confusion, Brian, because there's been some pretty significant adjustments in programs over the last couple months. And so that is something that we need to work on communicating better. Because And it's, it's hard to talk about batteries and Recycle Plus at the same time because Right. Everybody gets access to batteries and Recycle Plus is just those that opt in in certain jurisdictions. So it gets really kind of messy pretty quick, but yeah, okay. we need to keep working on it. Thank you for the, the, the information. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for coming and, and participating. 
Yeah, there, there was a lot of confusion about the batteries, but batteries are not part of Recycle Plus and they are able, anyone who has recycling service with their garbage can recycle batteries now for free. So, but they need to get the word out because a lot of people don't know. And, and next story, I know next story has been a, a flurry with all this stuff. And, I'll be it. I was invited to CPO one uh, by Virginia next week to talk about the different program changes too. So we're going to try to get more out there a little bit more. Great. That, that's my uh, district or area. Well, the next item is uh, the presentation, but um, Aaron won't be here to do the solid waste and recycling safety and disaster planning. Yeah, so I was going to replace that with our strategic plan update, and I'll just, um, as I start loading our my presentation up for you, um, I will just preface this by saying this is earlier than we really wanted to dive in. Um, we had planned on giving a quick verbal update about the work we've been doing on the strategic plan, and then sharing actually a draft version with committee members for you all to kind of have over the next month, and then when we meet again in October, we would love to have a quick conversation maybe about um, thoughts and if there was any input or feedback or reactions to the strategic plan, we would just love to receive that information from you all. So I'm going to go ahead and give a, a good overview of the plan, kind of uh, the high level um, goals and objectives and mission value vision that we've drafted with our um, partners. Um, and then I will go ahead and Kathy will send you a copy of the draft plan. It's nothing pretty yet. It's still a word document. It's very drafty, um, but it but it's got the meat in it. So let me load this up. I'm sorry, talking. Okay. Can you see it? Yes, okay. So I will give an update here on our strategic plan work. So quick background about the strategic plan and the strategic planning effort. Um, our division, the work that Solid Waste and Recycling does is guided by multiple plans and frameworks. This is one of the challenges of the work we do. Um, some of the more foundational guiding documents uh, that we follow or we work within is the 2030 Regional Waste Plan. That's the, probably the primary document that guides a lot of our work. Um, we are also guided by DEQ in the state um, and the 2050 DEQ Vision and Framework for Action is a big um, guiding document for us. We also are embedded in the Health and Human Services Department here at Washington County and as a part of Washington County as the whole organization. There's plans and um, strategic plans throughout our our, our systems and, and the bodies we work within. The, the challenge is that our plate, so if, our, if we were at a meal and solid waste and recycling was loading its plate up, we have too much on the table and we can't possibly consume it all. So we need to pick what we want to prioritize when we do our work, because we would rather do less things better than more things not good. So we wanted to go through that process of, of identifying those priority focus areas. Um, so we went through the process and we engaged with a um, consulting firm, the Metropolitan Group, who does this work. They only work with nonprofit and mission-driven organizations, and they do support um, planning efforts and those types of bodies of work. Um, Metropolitan Group conducted a series of stakeholder interviews, talked with folks that, um, that are, interact with the Solid Waste and Recycling Division a lot, that are important partners to the Solid Waste and Recycling Division, and gained some information and feedback about how the work group shows up, how the, how the division shows up in their eyes. Um, they also did a lot of work reviewing existing community engagement work. Uh, Metro did a tremendous amount of work with the community during the 2030 Regional Waste Plan development. We, they hosted listening sessions and contracted with community-based organizations to invite community members in to talk about what the solid waste system can do to better serve them. Instead of going back out ourselves and asking the same questions over and over again, we uh, balanced the, um, tried to rely and leverage the work that had already been done and try to honor the input that was already received by the work Metro did. <clears throat> we also uh, held multiple all staff work 
shops and, and, and meetings to talk about our priorities and our different work plans and the different types of work that, that staff felt was important in the next uh, three to four years. And then now we're in the process of seeking feedback and further engagement with our important uh, partners, including your committee. So the, the, this, this next sections are lots of words and I apologize for that. And like I said, Kathy will send out a draft um, of the plan after this meeting, but I kind of am gonna walk through the, the real high level parts of it. <clears throat> so the, these, uh, the vision of the, the draft vision statement for the, for the division is that is a sustainable, informed, healthy and resilient community. That's our overall goal when we look into the future um, for what we want to see. Our mission, which is why we exist and who we serve. Our mission statement, our draft mission statement is to ensure the health and safety of our community through responsible materials management, policy development, culturally responsive education and the active engagement of the diverse voices we serve and our values, which are what we collectively believe in and stand for and what guide our decisions, our equity and inclusion, transparency, collaboration, and education. <clears throat> Through the development, we've uh, drafted five overarching goals. Um, these goals are intended to be goals that we work towards between uh, January of 2023 and December of 2026. So it's a four-year time frame. This is uh, intentionally designed to be coming into the first, the beginning of the Recycling Modernization Act, we intend to, uh, or we anticipate the Recycling Modernization Act will adjust our work. Um, it's gonna bring in new partners as the producer responsibility organizations come in to the scene and start conducting some of the work we're doing in terms of recycling information and education. And so we're gonna wanna take another look at our strategic plan and think about how it might be adjusted if we have more ability to lean into different spaces um, based on the different work products that we're responsible for in the, after the RMA is implemented. But our five overarching goals, so the first goal, goal one, is that historically marginalized and systemically excluded communities experience more equitable outcomes when interacting with the solid waste system. Our second goal is that all community members thrive in a healthy and safe environment, free from the negative impacts of solid waste. Goal three is that there's a shift in our community narrative away from downstream recycling based solutions to one that focuses more upstream. Four is that the community is resilient and can withstand a solid waste system disruption. And five, that the division has a high performing team that reflects the demographics of our community and has the skills knowledge, infrastructure, and support needed to advance our mission. Kind of breaking down into those five goal areas, we have different objectives under those goal areas. Goal one is the equity and inclusion goal area. Our first objective is that our division's policymaking and administrative and programmatic decision-making process will be guided by an equity lens. Objective one, two, is that we wanna shift decision-making to be more inclusive and center the input and priorities of historically marginalized and systemically excluded community members. Goal two, health and safety for environments. Objective one, two is that our waste collection and disposal services are delivered to all unincorporated Washington County community members with improved efficiency, responsiveness, and safety, removing barriers that hinder priority communities from accessing services fully and engaging in expanded waste recovery opportunities. Objective 2.2, communities have equitable access to garbage and recycling collection services as a result of maintaining fair and just, just and reasonable service rates and a transparent rate review process. 2.3 is that the health, safety, and welfare of our community is protected from the risks associated with solid waste and other nuisance conditions. Goal 3 focuses on upstream interventions. Objective 3.1 is to create and disseminate compelling and culturally responsive messaging that calls to action for achievable waste prevention and sustainable consumption behavior. So develop the messaging for waste prevention more succinctly. Make the messaging available to our community members in Objective 3.2. In Objective 3.3, we want to see the decision makers and our community influencers, media and businesses and others communicate and champion the upstream materials messaging. Goal four area is resilient communities. This is more of emergency preparedness and disaster planning goal areas. 
We want to make sure our emergency management preparedness framework complements regional emergency management planning efforts. We want to successfully lead local response efforts to service disruption or other um, events or emergencies that impact our solid waste system. And we want community members to have received emergency preparedness instructions and information and know how to access um, information in real time. Five, we want to have a high performing team. We want to evaluate our recruitment and retention policies. We want to attract top tier staff who reflect our community's diversity at all levels. We want team members to be provided ongoing opportunities for professional development and growth. We want to foster a work environment that upholds the vision's values where employees are empowered, appreciated, and supported. As I mentioned, uh, we are sharing this kind of early uh, information or the, the draft strategy, the goals and objectives, looking for any feedback, um, discuss uh, more with the committee. We'll be back in October um, if you want to take some time to digest the document and we would welcome any thoughts, input or feedback. I'm gonna stop screen sharing. I'm sorry that was dry. I did that at the last minute. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Tom. So the next uh, presentation, I don't know if uh, Marcus and Christina are here for the equity, diversity, and inclusion. So, Vice Chair Smith, um, I guess first I'd, I'd make sure that if any folks had any questions about Tom's presentation, just to just give an opportunity and, okay. and then uh, we can go from there. Okay, does anyone have any questions or comments about Tom's presentation? I would just say it, it's nice that we're going to a, a place that it was, I think it was, I was focused more on the, the disaster preparedness, but just over the years with, you know, it takes away the guesswork with like the heat and possible smoke tomorrow. We have like actual standards, so it's not up to interpretation. Um, so I think that's a good, good way to go. Yeah, thanks, Vinod. I think that's something we've been seeing more of. You know, we every we're starting to. It used to be snow and ice policies, um, and then we had you know hazardous air in 2020 and 2021 that interrupted services. Um, we had some heat events this year, and early starts are a strategy that the garbage haulers are using to protect workers from the high heat in the afternoons. So we get requests to waive or to allow early starts before the normally allowed 6 a.m. And we do that uh, when the heat is above a certain degree threshold, but it's, it's been hard to line up with metros, transfer stations, and the disposal sites, and all the jurisdictions are kind of flying by the seat of their pants. And so we're really working closely to, to develop more standards that are, that are better and also flexible because I think we've also learned that rigid standards um, are prone to be tested um, I know, for example, this year, the, the city of Portland adopted a new approach and they used a hundred degree mark as kind of the threshold for servers curtailment. And then the transfer stations all started closing when it was 95. So that didn't work because you can't pick up garbage if you don't have anywhere to take it. So we need to work better as a system to, to think through these kind of contingencies and plans. We also just recently entered into a MOU, uh, which is a memorandum of understanding with Metro to, to really line out uh, who's responsible for what in response to a, in a debris generating event is what we would call it, but say a windstorm or an emergency that, that drops a lot of material in our communities. So we're trying to line out or delineate our responsibilities so that we aren't stepping on each other's toes when, when something like that happens as well. Any other questions or comments? So maybe we could take a five minute break that make sure that there's time for um, Marcus to come. Does that sound reasonable? Okay. Six forty six. Uh, I'm a program coordinator on that team uh, with Christina. 
I use he and him pronouns. Hello, all. Good evening. My name is Christina Barbosa. I use she, her, AYA pronouns. I am also a program coordinator in the Office of Equity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement on the Community Engagement Team. Thank you for having us here tonight. I'm checking to make sure everybody's back. It looks like everyone is, so uh, you can go ahead and uh, do your presentation. All right, well, uh, thank you for having us. Sorry, I'm kind of running around. I just came back, I was coaching, so I'm like, ugh, my head's all over the place. Um, but I'm here. Happy to be here. Uh, so uh, we're here today to talk a little bit about uh, um, EDI, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, um, and what we're doing in Washington County, um, <clears throat> uh, specifically in regards to boards and commissions. Um, but before we get into the meat of what we're doing specifically as a county, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a, a, a racism 101. Um, and uh, part of the reason I do this is uh, it helps set context of what it is that we're talking about as we're moving forward in progress um, through the county in our in our journey for um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So um, uh, I'll go ahead and start. And at any point, I just want to say, uh, if someone has questions, feel free to just like raise your hand or interrupt me. Uh, this is a formal presentation, but I'm a very informal person, so uh, feel free to just interrupt us and say like, hey, like, what do you mean by that? Uh, totally okay with all of that. Um, <clears throat> cool. So first thing we're going to do is, is talk about racism. Um, when we think about racism, uh, what's kind of the first thing that comes to mind? Um, and anyone can just shout this out. First thing that comes to mind when you think of the word racism. KKK. KKK, good. Prejudice. Prejudice, absolutely. What else? One more. Let's get one more. Oh, I see it on your chart, as I was about to say, but bias, you know, in, implicit. In, in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> thank you. So, you know, what, what kind of normally comes up in our brain are those very interpersonal racism uh, things. Right, our individual bias, um, implicit bias. Um, the KKK is another example of that. Um, you know, from their like person to person interactions, right? Prejudice, individual prejudice, right? That's something that we think of when we think of racism. Racism isn't just that, right? There are levels of racism um, that all kind of grow and play into each other. Um, and I'll talk about each piece of them individually, but for the sake of, of, of what everything that we're doing, we're looking at the institutional level of racism, right? So uh, the first level of racism that I wanna talk about is internalized. And that's the one on the bottom here, right? <clears throat> so that's beliefs within individuals, including stereotype threats. So what that means is, you know, uh, I'll give a personal example. So somebody like me, um, I'm half black and half white. And, um, you know, society identifies me as black, right? If I walk into a room and say I'm black, nobody bats an eye. If I walk into a room and say I'm white, people are like, no, you're not, right? And so because of that, right, I've internalized some of that, you know, uh, hatred of parts of me because kind of the societal structures have created this world where there is a pure and an unpure, right? You can not be pure and mixed, right? So there's that piece. There's also like, I can walk into a room with a bunch of black folks and then I also feel like mm, maybe I'm not black enough, right? That's internalized racism, right? So that's me feeling the things that the structures and society has kind of put on to me, right? So that's one level of racism. The next level, this is the popular one. This is the, the racist. This is Joe Bob down the street who's yelling, you know, profanities at different people of different cultures, right? That's uh, implicit bias. That's the boss not hiring somebody because they don't like them because they're brown or they speak a different language, right? Um, that's that interpersonal racism. That, that's, that's the marketable racism. That's the one that, that's easy to talk about, easy to say, we don't like that. 
it's very easy um, to point that out and say, no, bad, don't stop, right? Um, the next level, this is the one that's a little more tricky, right? This is the one uh, institutional where you have policies, practices, structures that create unequal outcomes for people of different races. For example, uh, schools, right? Schools have, uh, if you look across the board at schools, outcomes are worse for black and brown folks than they are for white folks, right? And that's because when those institutions were created, they were created in a system made by white people for white people. It wasn't purposely to think about, oh, well, 200 years from now, we want to make these brown folks worse. They just didn't even consider it. It wasn't even something that was thought of, that black folks, brown folks, uh, other people of color, it, indigenous folks to this country should have the same outcomes as white folks. It just wasn't even considered. And so when we're talking about institutional policies, policies and practices, it's things that are so deeply embedded within our systems that we don't even notice that they're there because we're so used to it, okay? So that's institutional, that, that's our major focus, is trying to change those policies, trying to, to right some of those wrongs by creating things with the intentionality of changing the institution, changing the systems. And then the last one is structural. So that's the top kind of overarching thing. This is the one that captures everything. This is the relationships between the systems. It's the, uh, you know, my internalized beliefs creating me as a boss that does things interpersonally to people that then create institutional imbalances, right? This is kind of the overarching everything. This is the cumulative of all of those institutions coming together to create societal norms, right? Where it's really easy to say, well, they're brown and maybe it's harder for them to understand this, right? It makes that kind of sentiment not feel as bad as it should, right? So those are the four different levels of racism. And so when I hear the term racism, I'm thinking of this system. And so that's kind of step one of what I want us to be able to do, you know, uh, as a county, as a, as, a, as a community, right? Is to be able to, to stop thinking of racism as just the interpersonal racism. Because racism is, all of these things and all of them play into our daily, hourly, minutely lives. Okay, all right, so that's first page. Um, the next uh, thing here, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the black experience in this country, right? I'm not gonna touch on the uh, Latin American experience, the uh, Native American experience, the Asian American experience, right? There's all these different experiences in this country. I'm gonna talk about the black experience. Um, so that, there's a caveat, talking about the black experience. There's all the different experiences. Um, so black folks have been in this country since 1619. That's a little over 400 years, uh, 403 years. Um, for 246 of those years, between 1619 and 1865, black folks were slaves. They didn't have any citizenship rights. They were viewed as property. It, it was slavery as we know it. That is 61% of the black experience in this country. Sit with that for a moment. 61% of the black experience in this country was slavery. The next phase of the black experience in this country was there was basically no citizenship rights. It's that post-slavery, pre-Civil Rights Act time, uh, commonly referred to as Jim Crow. Um, so that period of time, Black folks, while they weren't technically slaves anymore, they weren't citizens. They didn't have the same rights as white folks 
white men to be specific. Um, and that's another 25% of the black experience in this country. So add that together, we're at 85% of the black experience in this country has been secondhand citizenship at best, right? And then you look at uh, from civil rights on, 65 on, um, black folks had most citizenship rights. I'm not gonna get into you know, the whole prison industrial com complex, the war on drugs, right? All those things that may or may not be equal citizenship. Um, I'm gonna say may not. Uh, all those things, I'm not counting those in this, in this slide here, right? I'm talking about according to the law, black folks have equal citizenship. 14% of the experience of this country. Think about 14% of your life. How much time is that? So it's not a lot, right? Let's see, I'm, no, 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 no. let me stop that analogy because I don't wanna do, I don't wanna do math. Uh, I'm 36, 14% of that is a number, right? So I have no idea what it is, um, but it's a short number. And in the grand experiences of my life, I have learned so much. I have traumas. I have, you know, deep-seated feelings about things from 85% of my life that there's an expectation that we just forget all that because for these last 50 years, you've had equal rights, right? So, and then looking at the grand scheme of things, so 100% of the time, the struggle has been real for Black folks in this country. Right, and that's looking at outcomes, that's looking at all of that. <clears throat> this is just another way to kind of visualize that. Um, <clears throat> uh, same, same information, different way to visualize it. Um, <clears throat> and this is another way that we visualize that, right? So <clears throat> as we're talking about outcomes, that's really what equity work is all about, is about changing outcomes, right? We've all seen that image of the people standing at the fence and you know they all have the equal boxes, right? So that's essentially what we're talking about here, right? So you look at the, the, the white journey to the finish line over here. We've got uh, free land from Indians, uh, free labor from slaves, um, all pretty smooth sailing for the most part in terms of structural things. You look at the black experience here, we got slavery. Uh, we'll take a turn here. We got Jim Crow laws. We're gonna take lose some turns here. We got lynchings. We're gonna lose some turns there. Uh, denial of voting rights. Uh, nope. KKK. Yeah, nope. Sharecropping. We're losing some turns there because we're not actually owning anything. Segregation. Yep. Nope. Separate but equal it was not the business. Bias courts and cops. Yeah, we're still whining and turning, redlining, right? Changing housing laws based on black folks. Civil rights era. Hey, hey, we got something good. Civil rights era, right? So we get to move ahead a little bit. So I was like, yes. Woo. And we turn the corner here. Oh, no. And then we got poor schools. We got gang culture. Oh, oh, we get affirmative action. Something good. We get to move forward a little bit. No, oh, disproportionate prison incarceration. We got to go back a little bit subprime mortgages, oh, we gotta go back a little bit. And then looking at the wealth, ga wealth gap, mm. and then, you know, this speaks for itself, right? This guy looking over at the other guy saying, are you just slow or what, right? So this is just another visual representation of some of the barriers that um, black folks as, uh, you know, in our experience in this country have, have had to deal with, right? Now, individually, different individuals have different things. I'm talking, uh, the, 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 the scope, the wide scope of things. Um, and again, this is not talking about the Native American experience or the Mexican American experience or the Cuban American experience, none of that. It's just the black experience. And then uh, the last slide I'm gonna talk about here is uh, as we're talking about white supremacy, um, it's something that is coming up a lot um, and people feel attacked when they hear the term white supremacy, white folks feel attacked. Um, like I said, I'm half white. Um, I'm, I have these conversations with my mom uh, frequently. Um, and she gets, she, she did get offended by the term white supremacy. Um, now white supremacy is different than white privilege. 
white supremacy is this idea that white folks are better inherently and it should stay that way. White privilege is things are a little bit, we don't have the same barriers that people of color have, right? So that's different. And so there's a lot of overt white supremacy. And again, this is the easy thing. This is the easy thing to look at and be like, bad, no, stop, don't, right? That's hate crimes, swastikas, using racial slurs, the KKK, making racist jokes, right? It's really easy to call those out and say, that's bad, stop it. Because again, a lot of that is that interpersonal racism, right? And that's the overt, socially unacceptable white supremacy, right? But what happens a lot is this covert white supremacy. And this is where we have an obligation. We, you, me, everybody here, your friends and family have an obligation to recognize and acknowledge that this exists and to, to say something about it when it does happen, right? So uh, you have racial profiling, right? That happens. And people are like, ah, no, it was just speeding. It just happened and gets the cop on a bad day. Make America great again, implying that, you know, for that 85% of our history, things were a little bit better because black folks didn't have the, the, the same things, right? Uh, Confederate flags, the school to prison pipeline, people just flat out not believing the experiences of people of color. That is a big one, right? When we're saying, ugh. Microaggressions, yes, they are micro, but they are death by 10,000 cuts. And people are just like, yeah, but I just made one little mistake. Well, you know, it's the 19,000th mistake we've heard this week, right? So believing the experiences. Um, what about me? What about my experience, my personal experience? My family had to work hard, right? Yes, your family did. No one's taken that away from your family, but acknowledge that there was privilege, right? Um, blaming the victim, we're just one human family, racist mass, it's just a joke, right? So there's all these socially acceptable things that happen. And I guarantee you, everybody in this space right now has probably all of these, but most of these have seen and had a personal experience where either you or someone very close to you has done this, myself included. And so, <clears throat> This is just kind of calling the awareness to what some of these issues are, right? Because the, the longer that we avoid these uncomfortable conversations, the longer this continues, right? Um, <clears throat> I read something recently, I'm gonna bring it up here because I think it's, it's relevant. Uh, it was talking about, hold on, let me find it. Um, mm, Colorblindness, right? That's another one that's in that covert white supremacy area. Colorblindness. Um, a, a quote here that I read in this book called Courageous Conversations About Race. Um, uh, it's in a colorblind school, there is no safe place for someone of color. Think about that for a second. That's where I'm kind of going to leave it, right? In a colorblind school, there is no safe place for someone of color. Now think about your systems. Is your workplace colorblind? Is your church colorblind? And just think about that. And then with that, I'll turn it over to Christina. <laughs> Thank you, Marcus, um, for the information you've shared. You know, folks, you know, oftentimes when we think about the impacts of, you know, racial discrimination or systemic racism, you know, what I call and have a response is like, well, I don't do that. So there's no issue. I would never do that. So therefore things are okay. But it's just more than just us, right? I, as a female, I, you know, self-identify as female Latina, you know, come from a very traditional Mexican home, um, you know, there, there are barriers and there's issues and there's accessibility concerns that I have, even as an educated woman in a professional setting. 
And so these are the conversations that, ha that have to happen as uncomfortable as they are for all of us to grow. We all have a, a responsibility and onus, right? To do something different when we know better and when we are able to use information that the others share through their experiences and not really questioning or asking individuals of colors to validate their experience because we cannot conceptualize nor empathize with them that that is their experience. And so that's where we're heading as a county, right? As a whole, we're looking into this direction of, you know, how do we center equity in our work, our practice and our policies so that we can grow together as an organization um, and bring folks to the table that have been historically and are currently being excluded and marginalized in our community through, you know, no, I, I don't want to say like, oh, it's purposefully done. But when you live in a country where it's uh, founding fathers, right, created a system that purposely excluded anyone who was not a white land owning male. And that is how we started our life as a country. There's a lot of work to be done. And you have 400 years of this right at every level, just because changes were made, just because civil rights happened. What we've noticed in government and what we've noticed in public practice is that you can have as many policies and you can have as many resolution or orders or amendments, but it's the implementation of the practice that makes the difference, right? And so with that, Washington County adopted a uh, equity resolution in 2020. And with that adoption, you know, we're acknowledging as a county that there is a long history of racial discrimination that has produced barriers for people of color and members of ethnic communities. You know, with that recognition, we also want to celebrate the diverse, the diversity and the cultures within Washington County. You know, we want to guide the county's long-term efforts um, to advance racial equity and create more inclusive community for all, right? When folks think of, uh, uh, you know, cultural diversity or ethnic diversity, yeah, that's great. We are starting and we are leading with race, right? But there's also other forms of diversity that, you know, are elevated when we're focusing and starting with race. That includes individuals with just, you know, who have disabilities or experience or are not able bodies, that includes folks with different learning styles, you know, the gamut of things, different life choices, different lifestyles, different identities, you know, culture is not just ethnic culture, it's lots of different things. And with that, you know, it may, this resolution allows us to commit to develop an understanding of the inequities in county policies and programs and what practices cause that and really addressing root issues, not just a, acknowledging them, having a policy, but not having implementation practice or changing a practice. And then it also commits us to striving to act with humility um, and openness as we evolved um, new and better insights of how to achieve a more equitable Washington County. You know, that's why you're all here, right? We're here for, for a reason. Next slide. The other part of our resolution is to really have discussions about how diversity in a group or in a county, in a board or a commission really leads to inclusion of others that leads to equity. So you can't have equity if you don't have diverse perspectives and if you don't include others, you know? So with our diversity, we're defining that, you know, different identities, different cultures, right? Inclusion, the quality, participation across all identities and cultures. When you have different identities and cultures able to participate in decision-making or, you know, in bodies, commissions, boards and commissions, you know, you end up with more just policies and practices and procedures that do ensure equitable outcomes. And that's equity, right? That is equity. Next slide. So some of the items that or uh, strategic areas that we're focusing on the equity resolution um, as to why are we focusing on equity? Again, representation matters, right? Representation at the table matters. I. Um, was very excited when I logged on right now and noticed um, the diversity within this group, not just ethnic diversity age-wise, right? Just from what I can see. 
you know, just logging in, not even asking questions or asking introductions or backgrounds. You know, folks who are Generation X versus millennials, you know, they everyone has a different response and representation and ideas, right? And that's really diversity as well, right? And then when you're able to provide diversity, the inclusion practice and the types of decision, the information, the opportunity for dialogue increases. And then, you know, at the end of the day, equity is about outcomes. So what is happening? What is going on? What are the decisions that are being made? You know, and racial equity exists when we can't predict outcomes by race or ethnicity. So Mark has talked about, you know, the prison or mentioned, you know, um, was it, there was like a slide on our like prison to pipeline, you know, for um, black youth in America, right? That is not equity, right? True equity would be when we can't say, you know, BIPOC youth, black youth, Hispanic youth, Latinx youth, you know, are eight times more likely, I'm speaking up that number, to be incarcerated removed from their home because of the color of their skin, right? That when we can no longer use data to pinpoint outcomes based on race is when we have achieved equity. Next slide. As a part of the equity resolution that was adopted um, in 2020, we did a countywide discrimination and harassment free policy training um, for all our staff, right? This policy applies to all employees, all interns, all contractors, and all volunteers. So the discrimination and harassment free workplace policy applies to you, right? You are a part of the change that's happening in Washington County. You are held to the same standard as we are when it comes to discrimination, harassment, free workplace in Washington County. So if you haven't taken this training, let's talk. <laughs> Next slide. A part of the resolution called out um, equity-centered civic engagement. This is when Marcus and I come in, right? Our purpose in our office is to ensure that communities of color, historically and currently underrepresented and marginalized communities have the ability to be at the decision-making table, right? And then ensuring that members reflect the community, members of our boards and our commissions. You know, the group that you're participating in, does your board reflect the community that you serve, right? It asks for demographic questions so that we're able to ensure that that is accurate, right? We can't make assumptions based on last names. We can't make assumptions, you know, um, based on what we think is diverse, right? We, we, we have to know the information. And then it also supports pathways for participation, participation decision-making. And this is achieved in various ways. We have civic leader trainings that we partner with nonprofit organizations, the community that um, reach out to very diverse communities, um, ethnic communities to ensure that they're provided with opportunities to learn about government, about the governance of boards and commissions how to participate, how to apply, so that they also can, can participate in this process alongside you all. Um, I know this group has participated in some of our civic leadership training, open houses with other boards and commissions, right? Ensuring that folks feel welcome um, to participate and that when they are here, when they are in space with you, that there is a welcoming environment. Another great thing about the equity resolution with boards and commissions is that we're really looking um, in one of our equity leadership committees for best practices of boards and commissions about language and the governance, um, you know, the documents of boards and commissions across the county. Does the governing, the governing documents reflect inclusive and diverse language? Does it reflect accessibility, inclusivity of community members who are wanting to participate um, in the decision-making bodies of Washington County or advising bodies. Next slide. Oh, we covered that side, <laughs> right? So again, you know, within uh, with a center, uh, equity-centered civic engagement, you know, we're really hoping to strive for inclusion of county boards and commissions. This board looks great. It's a great start, right? Unfortunately, the reflection of what I see on the screen today, um, and we compare it to other boards and commissions, it may not be as diverse, right? Again, welcoming diverse perspectives and approaches. Again, different cultures, different backgrounds, different generations have different ideas, different perspectives, different approaches. You know, people think outside the box differently. Um, people think, look at issues differently based on the lens in, of their life experiences in which they're viewing conversations. And then really what we would like to see in civic-centered engagement 
is support for each other and mentoring of, you know, community members who want to participate in boards and commissions, you know, who would like to be a part of this process, but may not know how. They may not have the experience, just like Marcus showed that, like, um, you know, board game. There's all these other different things life things that happen that really impact someone's ability to participate. You know, for example, this meeting, this committee meets in the evenings, right? It, is it accessible to community that you're trying to outreach, right? It's probably more accessible than a meeting that's held at 10 o'clock in the morning for a board or a commission, right? When you have boards and commissions that meet during the day, it's probably less likely that folks are able to participate because they're working or they have children or they're parenting, you know, or they have doctor's appointments. There's all these things that happen during the day when office hours are in service, right? Language support and ADA access. I was so happy. My heart like skipped a couple beats when I saw the interpreters logged on and on this meeting. I was like, wow, this is amazing to be able to log into a meeting um, and not have to ask for interpretation for me as a Spanish speaking individual. Like th that to me, that's inclusion, right? That's allowing and creating accessibility without putting the onus and the pressure on the person needing the service to be able to participate, recognizing that others do not speak English or are not native English speakers. Next slide. And questions, right? <laughs> what do you have going on? What what we laid a lot of information out really quick. Um, you know, it went from racism 101 to what are we doing in Washington County? You know, how are we approaching this? What can you all do? Um, so you know, very quick, but turn it back to you if you have questions. You know, what are you thinking? What are your reactions? And I see Tom's hand up there. Yeah, Christina, I I just wanted to share a couple examples of the equity work in our industry and in, in solid waste and recycling because I know when I when we started this journey it was tough for me to think about like garbage trucks and equity and it just like what does that mean for garbage service and how it didn't like you know I was thinking like what Marco's talking about like overt racism and you know these types of actions and activities and there's two really good examples that I have I'm, one really good example and maybe another one that is helpful too that has happened over the last couple of years. We learned from a community member um, a couple, three or four years ago that they weren't able to get garbage service because the garbage company that served their house, their address in a franchise system, they don't get a choice. They get service from a company like the utility required either a social security number or a driver's license number. And this community member didn't have either of them. And so de facto that resulted in this community member being denied access to an essential service because they didn't I mean they didn't have these documents that we consider everybody has these documents you know i think that's probably the assumption and it helps go to collections if someone doesn't pay their bills and it makes it easier to to recover costs that maybe didn't get paid but the outcome of that is that people are being denied service because they don't have the right documents and that is not equity. So one of the things, you know, we did and this committee worked on that was we changed the rules to require only certain types of information can be collected to start service. So it's name, address, and a contact information. And everybody should have access to that type of information if they need service. And another example in that same rulemaking package is we required the service providers to provide implicit bias training to all of their customer service staff once a year. And that just helps kind of think through some of these issues. And so there's that awareness in terms of how those customer service staff are interacting with community members. If someone calls and is not speaking English, they have to provide translation services, but how do you go through that? How's the, what's the pathway for a customer service rep to work with an individual to get over to a translation service company? So those are things that I think we should all be thinking about. And it's hard it, at first for me, it was tough to think about equity and garbage service because it just didn't really line up. But when you really think about it, it's about access and outcomes. And if we want everybody to be able to stay health and healthy and safe in our community and have access to these essential services, we need to think about the barriers and the root causes of some of those inequities. Very, very well put. And, and you know, one thing that that I like to say, uh, because I like it's 
very true is if there is a system, there are inequities. They, they, that it's a fact. Look at any system, you will find inequities. And so, a uh, perfect example, right? And we're like, well, how, how the garbage? How, how do we, you know, how are we doing this? You know, we're just picking up trash, you know, but perfect examples. Perfect examples. Because I, that's the thing is, I can't sit here and explain those nuances because I don't know them. I'm not in those systems. Right. And that's why the like the language access for like Christina was talking about is so important because you have folks that have very good ideas and people that that aren't native English speakers. Uh, first of all, let me just say us as single language speakers like myself, like we're totally behind the curve of the world. Uh, most people speak more than one language. We're just trash and we like to like put our trash on the other people. Um, and so uh you know when you do start learning another language and you you could be fully fluent in that language conversationally but when it comes to systemic change those kind of in-depth conversations it's going to be hard to pull those words out when you need them right about these little intricacies of these individual systems and that's why like Christina was saying interpretation is so important right because someone can come in here and they may speak English just fine, and you may not know that there's a, an issue there. But being it's their second or third language, to do the intricacies of each particular system is a little bit more difficult. And y'all, the stuff that y'all talk about here, if you, you're just talking about it in English, I would probably not understand it because it's very in-depth and it's not something that I'm versed in, right? So you may have someone that's super versed in this that wants to come and participate, but they know that, well, in English, I can't explain myself as well. Right, and so having those interpreters on hand is so important. You know, Tom, I really appreciate your example. You know, one of the things that we talk to folks about, like, well, how do we begin? You know, it's where do we start, right? What is manageable? What is not, right? How how do we begin system overhaul, system changes? How do you change four hundred plus years of inequities and racism? You know, but one is like having the conversation and acknowledging that there's an issue. But the, the, the idea that I appreciate, Tom, that you shared is that when you center your practice and your response based on the inability of, of folks to participate in access services, and you create policy and practice focusing on that population, who is not having the ability, who does not have the ability to access services? What are the barriers to services? And you start there and build your way out, right? Build, build your practice out. You know, you're gonna have it, a more diverse response, but a closer to yes in services than if you just start with the English pers English speaking perspective, the dominant culture perspective, right? Like, oh, trash gets picked up, you know, on Thursdays and, you know, everyone knows you have to go here to sign up for garbage. And, you know, like we have this assumption that everyone knows how to access a service. Right. And so we create policy and we engage in practice with the assumption that everyone knows how to access services, how, where to go, who to talk to, you know. And so when you shift your focus and your development and your growth of your, your organization to start off with who is, ha what are the barriers and who are the communities that are having difficulty accessing services and build out from there, you know. That's truly centering, centering equity in your practice, right? That that's you know that's why you you know you bring in interpreters, you know you bring in um, individuals who are experts in their culture, right? Because there's like Marcus said, there's there's something more than just being able to translate or interpret, right? There's culture nuances that happen. There's words in Spanish or in other languages that we can say something in English and they don't exist, right? They, like that word just does not exist in Spanish or that word just does not exist in Russian, you know, or, or whatever other language. And so you, not, you have to translate the function of what you're trying to share to get where you're trying to be because that word doesn't exist. What other questions are out there? Comments? It's not really a question, but thank you guys for sharing. Um, you know, I think you're right. Having these conversations is how we create change and even, even uh, 
you know, it might not be point on, but like the Portland Hauling Association has has developed driving for diversity. That's almost like targeted universalism where they're saying, hey, these people don't normally have access to these kind of jobs. We're going to help train people and, and bring them into the fold. So I think I think over, especially over the last few years, the, a lot of these conversations have really kind of opened people up, especially to the kind of the, the under the, the belly, like you were talking about, you know, like, you don't people don't realize that they're they're creating that system until they they go, oh, but yeah, maybe we need to do more. So I, I always appreciate these kind of conversations. Thank you, and and I appreciate for for those of you who had never heard the term targeted universalism, Google it and get some education from John Powell. Uh, th that's all I'm going to say on that. Targeted universalism is a fantastic ideology, which is essentially equity, just more deeply explained. And and uh, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, thank you. And, and really just the fact that you all are even having this conversation, the fact that you have Marcus and I here, right, having this conversation is a start and it should feel uncomfortable. You know, you should be uncomfortable, right? If you're, if you're not like, ooh, like then, then we'll have to chat about something else, but conversations about race should make you uncomfortable because it's, it's a horrid experience. It continues to happen. Right. I, as a brown woman, am uncomfortable talking about race, right? I often worry about, I don't want to be offensive or I don't want, you know, to make someone, you know, feel bad. My goal is not to make you feel guilty because you're white. That's not the purpose here, but the purpose is to be uncomfortable so that we can grow together, right? So that we can learn from each other and welcome to the club. That's been our existence in this country since the beginning of time. And it continues to be our existence. Right? The way that I show up in a space as a brown woman is far different than how a white woman or a white man shows up in this space. Right, We're supposed to be comfortable because that's where we grow. Other questions or reactions? Oh, Leslie, go ahead. Go ahead, Leslie. Um, it's not really a question. Just wanted to say thank you. I know that um, this requires a lot of personal vulnerability and um, it's appreciated. And this is my first uh, foray into like public service and knowing how central equity was in every step of like the application process and everything made me feel really good about that decision. Um, nothing is perfect and there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and it's just, it's nice to know that this is truly at the forefront and every single conversation we've had, every meeting has been you know, part of this forward march. So I just appreciate you being here. Thank you. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is, is we are available. Um, you know, uh, Kathy has our uh, contact information. You're welcome to send that out to everybody and um, feel free if you wanted to just chat, talk about, you know, what you can do in your systems. Um, we're we're here for it. Thank you guys so much for coming. Yes, thank you, Marcus and Christina. Um, you know, I wanted to. I didn't know if I was supposed to raise my hand or not, but I, I did want to comment something on on what Christina said. Is that um, our committee used to be called the Solid Waste Advisory Committee? And one of the reasons that we changed the name was because uh, solid waste, when it was interpreted, and I think it was Spanish, and maybe a couple other language, meant another thing other than garbage. <laughs> so, uh, but I thought I'd bring that up. That's kind of a funny thing there. So, uh, I guess the next thing on the list is oral communication, if anyone has anything. Well, let me just uh, close us out with a, with a quick quote okay. and then and then we'll 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 be gone. Um, uh, I love quotes and another quote that I have that to just kind of wrap this up is a quote from James Baldwin, uh, who's a, a writer and an activist from the uh, 60s and, and uh, James says, there is never a time in the future in which we will work out our salvation. The challenge is in the moment, the time is always now. And that's how we will leave you. All right, good night. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you.
So I didn't see any hands, Sandra. I know Beth's in the audience. Hi, Beth. Um, but <laughs> I didn't see her raise her hand. So. Okay. Um, is there anything any of the committee members want to bring up or talk about? No. I just had um, one thing uh, on Saturday, uh, Beaver, the Fred Meyer and Beaverton Hillsdale Highway is going to have a Green Day event. Oh, what's it called? It's not called that. Green Day's recycling event. There will be a recycling uh, cardboard, electronics, styrofoam, metal, and appliances. And that'll be 11 to 2 at the Beard and Hillsdale one on 114, 114th Beard and Hillsdale Highway locations. I don't know if there's any other big events coming up nearby. Sue, I saw your hand go up and then come back down. Did you have something? I don't have any events, uh, but Sandra, thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to thank staff for bringing Marcus and Christina to the table tonight, um, and I should have said it earlier. It is very uncomfortable when we have to deal with our own um, interpretations of things, and we don't even realize what they are until we're exposed to them. And my husband and I talk about this often not even understanding because we have no exposure. And so Marcus's comments about internalizing things really resonated with me because I think that's how we are a lot of times. So anyway, I just wanted to share that and say thank you um, for bringing them on board tonight. And I think we should have more of them coming to us and talking to us about this topic. I think it's really important and we can all learn from them. So thank you. Go ahead, Kathy. Thanks, uh, Sandra. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I, I will follow up with them and see if maybe we can have um, even some short you know, space in future meetings. Also, I'll, as part of what I'm gonna send out, I'm gonna send out the um, discrimination policy that um, I've not shared with you all because I didn't realize that it applied to um, boards and commissions, but so I learned something just um, from listening to them. So I will include that in the information that I send out after the meeting. I'm not sure what what we should do next. I guess adjourn or I think we're something. all good. We're ready to adjourn. It's at your call, Sandra. <laughs> right. Well, it's good to see everybody. And our next event will be the uh, um, field trip, which I am looking forward to. And I know all of you are, and everyone that signed up. That's really cool. So we'll see you guys on the is it the 29th? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good to Thanks. see you. Thanks for driving Bye. us, Tom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, <laughs> Bye. Bye. See you later. <laughs>